Howdy everyone, welcome to another episode of Devlogs. This week I got through lesson one of the 201 certification. Then I created a parallax script for my senior project. We're going to start with the table of contents for lesson one. I won't read through all of it like I usually do, there's a lot of sections, but you can pause and take the time to read through them and just know that I'll be narrating section by section. The lessons will be making references to a particular level within the game it has you download, called Q. You learn more about this in the installing course materials section that is before lesson one, which I'll brisk over some details of that real quickly. I am soon going to show gameplay of the cube game, and I want you to take note of the types of music and sounds going on. As you can see in this list, there are many types of composition that have been composed beforehand, of which we'll be exploring their implementation through WISE later on. Think about our soundscape when the player is exploring, in combat, fighting the boss when the player dies or achieves victory, and stingers. The last thing I will show is a project layout of the doll that the compositions were created on. Take note of how these were color-coded, labeled, and sorted in order for them to more easily be exported into WISE and deliver critical insights for the sound engineer. If you want more details on the structuring of such projects, visit the installing course material section of the 201 certification. Alright, here's some gameplay cube. Oh, no! 
these gems have magical force emanating from it. Gems have magical force emanating from it. No, no! Blast!
emanating from it. Ah, yes. you're familiar with the game and the fact that we'll be working with all of its musical elements, we can start lesson one. So the exploratory music at the beginning of the game has different iterations, which you can see in this picture of the doll. This is so we can maintain an unpredictable score throughout gameplay, and how the lesson plans on showing us is by musical sequencing. In order to sequence the varying iterations of music, there needs to be space between each iteration. This has been done, and you can see the space between each bit of music, which allows for the sound engineer to take that silence and properly set up a transition. Keep in mind that in between these transitions, sounds will fade out and come back in, but the player will never be met with full silence. There are many different types of music playing throughout the level that underlie the exploratory themes, and so we can afford to have fade outs and fade ins as we sequence. To do all this magical sequencing I've been talking about, we are going to jump to a hierarchy in the Project Explorer view of WISE, which is a hierarchy I have never messed with. It is the interactive music one, and is for the type of musical work we plan on doing. Like with any hierarchy, we will create a work unit to import audio assets into. I name the work unit Music, and after it is created, right-click it so that I can select the Import Files option. What's cool to note is when you import audio into this hierarchy, it will automatically be recognized as a musical segment. All of this is fine and dandy, but it would be nice to see these audio clips on a timeline. To do this, we go to Layouts in the top toolbar, then select Interactive Music. I'm going to right-click the timeline and select Bars and Beats. This changes the timeline to show measure numbers rather than seconds. 
This is also where the labeling of our music files begins playing a critical role because Wise is able to recognize the time signature and tempo of a song as long as we provide it this information. A reason this is important is because when I currently play the music, the downbeats of the song do not properly align with the measure numbers. This is something you would be aware of if you would compose the music yourself and imported it here, but listen to the music and see if you can catch this for yourself. The way we can align the audio to the measure numbers is by clicking a song in the Project Explorer. We then navigate to the Property Editor and in the Time Settings, input our tempo and time signatures. After I do this for all the songs, listen again and see in the timeline how the downbeats line up with the measure numbers. With proper configurations, this should enable us to do cool things that the lesson plans to show us. The rest of the songs have the same tempo and all need to be changed, but rather than do them all separately, I'll show you a way to change them all at once. By using Shift Select and selecting all of the tracks, I can right click and choose to show these in multi-editor. Once I am there, I navigate to audio, general settings, time settings, and then change the tempo for all songs at once. The lesson moves on and talks more about the format of files. I find this both interesting and insightful, but in an act of kindness, we'll hold back on the details. This part of the lesson is talking about transitioning musical segments and the importance of having a pre-entry and post-exit section for each musical piece. This is because we want our transitions to be gradual and not immediate. For example, Notice how the music objects have the label L, and then a number like 16, 17, or 3 beside it. These reference the amount of measures consisting of music. This is important to know because when we look at the timeline and the amount of measures, we now know how many measures were spent on a pre-entry or post-exit segment. Not only can we define how one piece of music transitions into the other, WISE allows us to overlay different musical themes as well. In order to achieve a natural sounding transition, we use the entry and exit cues. The entry is the green icon in the timeline, whereas the exit is the red. To reiterate what the meaning of the labels at the end of our songs mean, let's look at the first music object, where it says P1M. This means that there is one measure for pre-entry. L16 means that there are 16 measures of music. Knowing this, we can deduce that any extra measures within our timeline are for the exit, allowing for any reverberance from the instruments or possibly echoes to die out. Starting with the entry cue, I know our entry is one measure for the Explore Arpeggio theme, and so I drag it to the right. You'll see a negative number appears on our left, negative two. This will be our single measure of post-entry and where I position the silent part of the pieces beginning within. Notice how it lines up perfectly within the measure. I then know that the music itself is 16 measures long, meaning I will drag the red marker to the number 17, which is where the music should be finished and begin with the execute phase. I'm going to do this for the remaining musical segments, and at this point, we'll have decently configured musical themes. All right, so the pieces are configured and ready to play, meaning we move into the next thing in the lesson. Remember that there are many different types of music that play during the game, and so to better consolidate and play different pieces sequentially, we're going to use a music playlist container. I'm going to select all the musical segments, right click, then create a musical container under the new parent option. Since this is the many iterations of the Explore track, we will name the container Explore. Here is an important thing to note when creating a musical container. It comes with tempo properties that apply to all of its children objects. That means if I click through the musical segments, you'll see that they are once again unaligned. We could use the override parent checkbox to individually change the music segments that needed changing, but an easier alternative is to set the tempo to the container. 
Since it is a parent of those musical segments, which we can now interpret as children, the tempo of the parent will be given to all of those children objects. However, there is one instance where we actually need to use the override parent option, and it's with the bottom musical segment, transition to bridge. I had noticed this, but thought I was going crazy until the lesson mentioned it. The last musical segment is in a 3-4 time signature instead of a 4-4, like the rest. In this instance, I have to check the override parent checkbox and give this musical segment the 3-4 time signature in order for the timeline to be properly configured. Now, as this playlist becomes more and more populated, the lesson talks about the flexible ways in which you can sequence the music, and one of those ways is by the use of groups. As defined in this paragraph, groups are a playlist within a playlist. I like the way it breaks groups down, so I'm just gonna read it. Think of a group kind of like a playlist within a playlist. In a music library application, you could have an acoustic music playlist, and within that, you could have separate music groups to distinguish between fast tempo and slow tempo songs. Imagine being able to play your acoustic music in a way where the slow music group plays through all of its songs first, followed by all of the songs from the fast group. Or, how about the option of setting it up so that it plays a randomly selected song from the slow group, followed by a randomly selected song from the fast group? This is just the beginning of how flexible the WISE playlist system can be. To see this sort of flexibility, I'm going to drag and drop some music sequences in the music playlist editor. As I do, you'll see some options appear and we'll push further into what we can do. Because our entry and exit cues were defined, as well as the tempo and time signature, each musical sequence will seamlessly transition. The only thing to change is the loop count for the whole playlist because realistically, a player could be in the exploratory theme of a game for however long they want, meaning this playlist needs to be capable of looping endlessly. After I check this box, listen to the playlist and how the music transitions. You can see the exit and entry cues when two yellow arrows appear, signifying an approaching or diminishing musical segment. We can push this further though, and we'll do so now. I'm going to change the playlist mode from sequence continuous to random continuous. I then am going to change the weights of each musical segment. A higher weight means a higher chance to play, whilst a lower means less of a chance. To avoid a segment repeating, I'll change the avoid repeat value to zero. Let's listen to it again.
If the segments seem to not transition smoothly, simply consider changing the length of cues and making sure your configurations are done correctly for each musical sequence. To extend my control over the behavior of how the music sequences, we can create another group. After I click new group, I drag all sequences except the explore theme one into my new group. What I want is for the explore theme to always play first, then for it to move into the other playlist and randomly play the remaining sequences. To do this, I change the top group to sequence continuous, then the bottom group to random step. When the music plays, it should play the first song in our top group, then move to the random step group and play the remaining sequences randomly. We now have a pattern where the guitar sequence plays, then picks a random sequence from the other playlist, then jumps back to the guitar sequence. This is due to the first playlist being set to infinite, but let's start messing with random loop counts. First I'll change the loop count values, then double click the circle icon next to those text boxes so that they turn orange. This enables a randomizer that will determine a random amount of sequences to play within the set loop range. Lastly. I will change the random type dropdown from standard to shuffle. As sequences play within the bottom playlist, they will be removed upon playing once and leave the remaining ones that have yet to be played, guaranteeing variation. Take another listen to this configuration. I know that took a while, but you're doing great. So the bottom sequence had a min and max offset of negative one to one, meaning it can play one to three songs max when entering the random playlist. Not only did it decide to play three songs, we got to see shuffle mode in action because after each tune finished, it was guaranteed that they wouldn't repeat again until the other segments played. This is the last time we'll reconfigure it, but I promise it'll be more different. We're going to add a bridge into the mix, but using separate groups. What's more is I'm actually going to create two groups, because if you look inside the playlist container, you'll notice that there's a transition to bridge sequence, and then the bridge sequence itself. I want to have a group that plays just the bridge immediately, and then one that will play the transition and then the bridge, giving us two options for how the playlist can sequence into the bridge and then back to the top.
The loop amounts will stay as they are and we'll now listen to it once more to see how it sounds. So this time around, the first transition led to two loops in the first random step group. Shuffle mode will prevent the two sequences that played from playing again next time around, and so as expected, we had a higher chance of transitioning into one of the bridge groups instead of the remaining sequence in the random step group. However, after the bridge played, it did decide to play that remaining tune. When it finished playing, that group reset and all sequences were eligible to play again. And so not only did it loop in that area again and not go back to the top group, it played one of the brought back sequences. This is a pretty good take showing off shuffle mode and the way randomized loops work. Another way to understand what's going on is by starting a capture session on Wise, then playing the playlist and then going to the profiler while it runs, which shows you a log of Wise's thought process. This is a nicely set up playlist, meaning we're ready to create an event so that we can post this in a game engine. Unlike with sound SFX objects, we will use a music event to put our playlist into. I go to the events tab in the project explorer and after clicking a default work unit in the events tab, create a work unit called music. I then create an empty event in this work unit, also called music, and drag my playlist into the event property editor. With that done, I can create a sound bank specifically for music and after putting the event in it, generate my sound bank so that Cube will post the music event I made. Let's see how this turned out.
chunks of magical force emanating from it. So the music is definitely playing as intended, though I don't know if it's from my project file or the main one, because there are other musical sequences playing that I don't think are in the lesson one project file. I'm gonna look further into this. It could just be the sound bank is generating in the wrong location, but regardless, that is the end of lesson one. That brings me to Unity, where I have my parallax scene. I left off with the promise that I would get the script created and here we are now, ready to show it. I wanted to show this with the animated ship I've been working on in A-Sprite, so I went ahead and watched the video you see here, which was very helpful for setting up the animations. As for the parallax, I do not have it fully set up and correctly working yet, but I have at least made the script to a point where the camera follows the background. However, that's all the time I got for this week, so I'll have to give you a better update in the next video. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next video. Have a good one.